Are we good? Yeah. Outstanding. Good. All right. So we are good. I have a question for you all. Does anybody happen to know what is the largest freshwater lake in the world? Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe, right? Lake Tahoe. Caspian, Caspian Sea, right? Bacal. Bacal, right? It is Lake Superior. Thank you. Bacal is the deepest and Caspian is salt. So thank you. Yes, very good. See that? You're going to be amazing at Jeopardy now. Isn't that awesome? My name is Larry Sharp, and I want to talk to you about something today which we always talk about, and that's freedom. Now, the good thing about freedom is we talk about it often, and we talk about it because it's so good and amazing, and we give great uh, praise to it, but there's a problem. It's scary. It is scary for most Americans. There is a lot of fear involved with freedom. It's not just, oh, it's awesome, let's be free. Even though it's clearly a better way to be, a better place to be, it is scary to get there. When you talk to someone about freedom, they have one of two options. Number one is they say, I am free, right? I can go do what I want, I'm free. They don't even think they're not free. They believe that they are completely free. Well, the second thing, when you talk about things like, hey, wouldn't it be better if you were able to do X or do Y, or government was able to come out of X or Y? The first thing they think of is, without government, then what? We've been stuck so much on government doing so much for us for so long. Not having that makes us afraid. We become afraid of two things. General fear of not having government, but second, fear of disruption. That's a problem. So all of a sudden someone says, Larry, you know, this freedom thing, I, I, I'm with you, but what's gonna happen if there's no Department of Education? Who's gonna educate my kids? They're serious. What's gonna happen if all of a sudden the government's not there? Who's gonna protect me from the bad guys? Or the other thing they always say, if government's not there, then the rich will take over. Right? What they don't understand is, when it comes to all these things, most of it either has already happened or it's not a real fear. The rich have already taken over. <laughs> right? It's already here. With government for the past how many years, decades, it's still here. It's already happened. But they still fear it. If we tell them it's wrong, they don't believe it. So how can we get them to understand that this is actually a good thing? How can we get over their fear? Remember, we're a third party to them. We're the strange people to them. They look at Republicans and Democrats as the norm. How can we, as libertarians, as freedom-loving people, get those people to understand it's not scary? There are two things. Number one, discuss the idea of transition. What does that mean? When someone says, and we do say it all the time to libertarians, we're gonna abolish this, we're gonna abolish that, we're gonna abolish this, we're gonna abolish that. We love it, we're like, yeah, all right, yeah. And the rest of the world says, these people are crazy. <laughs> these people are insane. We want to start talking as a candidate, as a person, as a campaign manager, as how we're going to make the transition. We have to have a transition. And here's the best, most clearest example to me personally, and that is our veterans. Our veterans, who are particularly combat veterans in particular, who are over there right now or have been fighting in Afghanistan or Iraq or someplace else, they come back to the civilian world, clearly a better place to be than a combat zone. Yet they can't function. Yet they can't function because no transition. So what I mean by that is, for the average American, their fear that we laugh at, that we scoff at, is valid. And we as libertarians have to understand that. Their heads aren't there. They don't understand what we understand. They don't get what we get. We have to talk about how do we move them to this next step? How do we make them get into this idea of freedom is good, it's okay, something else will happen? And there are certain ways to do that. First one is to have an actual plan. I love that if you have that, but that, not required. If you don't have a plan, no worries. The other thing you can do is something very simple. You can walk them down that road. Simply talk it out. Here's the hardest part for us as libertarians, you can't get angry. Oh, that's hard for us. It's hard for us. You can't get angry. When a person says, oh my God, if we don't have taxation, how can we have roads? It'll never happen. You want to slap them. Don't. <laughs> Bad idea. Please don't slap them. Bad idea. Right? Don't do that. Instead say, okay, I have a question. What would happen if, we, if all of a sudden the government didn't, didn't build roads? 
Would there be no roads? Well, no, we'd have to make roads. Yeah. <laughs> we'd have to make roads, yeah. That would have to happen. And what we're doing as libertarians is understanding something. We see the end game as awesome. So we in our heads, we ignore the transition period. We ignore disruption. The true fear of freedom is not freedom. It's a transition and disruption before they get there. That's really the freedom that we have to understand and talk about and walk them through and be okay when they ask about it and walk them through it in a nice positive way. Not say, dummy, don't you get it? God, haven't you read Hayek? What's wrong with you? <laughs> it's what we do. I'm asking you as the individual person out there to understand that their fear is a valid fear. To understand that what they're concerned about is disruption and getting from A to B and we are really bad at showing them how. We are really bad at that. And we have to get better at showing them how to make that transition and get past that fear. But there's another fear, one that's not so obvious, one that's cultural. And that is, there's a fear of who's responsible if not government, right? It's very easy to always blame government when something goes wrong, right? Not my responsibility. It's very easy to say the government should license this. The government should uh, decide there should be a, uh, a certification for that because then they're responsible. Someone else is responsible and that's good. But what if there are no, what if there is no FDA? Then who's responsible? That's a serious fear they have. Does that make sense? I want you to realize their fears are not just silly fears. Many of them are valid and we understand it, but they don't. We have to walk them through that fear also. Who will be responsible? Who will take care of the injustice? We have to get them to understand that government's job in, in any way, shape, or form can only be to stop injustice, not to enforce justice. And there's a big difference between those two. If something is wrong, there is a victim, there is a crime, there is injustice, yeah, government can step in here and say, stop this injustice, okay. But does government assume that everyone is bad, wrong, corrupt, immoral, insert bad word here, so therefore I must regulate you so that you will be good, just, kind, whatever is the rule I'm trying to find? That's enforcing justice, and most people believe that's okay. We have to show them that we can still handle injustice without having to enforce justice. They are two separate things. So they assume, if I don't regulate uh, a business, it will by default kill people. I'm not joking. They believe that. If I don't regulate commerce, it will by default create slavery. That's what will happen. But no, if slavery happens, we'll stop slavery. But we shouldn't assume there will be slavery and then now regulate everybody. Does that make sense? And that while to us we get it, they don't. We have to show them the difference between injustice and justice. The idea of enforcing justice versus just stopping injustice. If we do this right, they will hear us. They will want to come to us. But then we must ask them, who is responsible? You will find how afraid they are by that question. Freedom requires responsibility. Freedom requires fear and disruption. But if we look in our lives and everything else, it's a great tool to use. Look at other aspects of our country, other aspects of our life, and tell to that person you're talking to and say, when it came to technology, was disruption a bad thing? What will most people say? No. We're happy there was disruption when the internet came. We're happy there was disruption when social media came out. That was the right answer. We're happy this happened because it made things become better. Disruption is the beginning of, of, of growth. Disruption is the beginning of, of strength and moving forward. That's what disruption is. Without disruption, what do you have? Decay. Without disruption, you have decay. And when people get that, that I have to accept disruption to get greatness, I have to fail my way to success, all of a sudden they go, oh, maybe the world's not going to end. Maybe it's okay to have some disruption. The other problem they have is, this is perfect. Everything's wonderful now. If I try your way, it's going to be bad. Yeah, it's possible, but that's disruption. If we didn't try the internet, if we didn't try the space race, if we didn't try insert cool thing here, it would never work. We have to try these new things. Your way right now, is it working? If we get them to accept disruption as a good thing, we can move forward. 
That's important for them to understand. But we must not dismiss it. And that's our problem. We dismiss it. Doesn't matter. Here's our answer. The free market will fix it. That's what we say. What do they hear? You don't care. What do they hear? Mad Max, right? Road warrior, fighting for gas in the streets with machine guns, right? That's what they hear, right? So we have to understand that that's important for them, that disruption piece is important. Fear matters. The key aspect I want to get across today, if I can, is to understand that freedom is scary for the vast majority of Americans. It's scary. And guess what? It should be. They're right. It is scary. They're wrong in that we shouldn't go there, but they're right in that it is scary, and we can't dismiss them. We have to make sure we understand them, and then we talk to them, and walk them through this, and we can get them to the right place. Thank you very much. I'm happy if someone has a question or comment to take any question or comment now. If someone has one, I'm happy to take one if anyone does. I have failed you all. <laughs> oh, I stunned. I was so good, I stunned you all into silence. I love that. I wish I wasn't that good. No question or comment? Does no one think I'm crazy? No one think I'm... Go ahead, please. I was wondering, when you find that you're trying to convert people, when you're giving them the... Uh, the idea of not disruption. What is the number one thing they say? How do they object to the idea of disruption? I love this. I love the question. And I talked about it in the room next door a little bit. When you're talking to someone at your dinner table and bringing this up, your goal actually isn't to win the argument. Your goal isn't to convert them. That isn't the actual goal. The goal is to just get them to doubt their own view. That's it. I, I can win the argument all day and I will lose the war. I just want them to doubt their own view. How you know you're winning, and you've had this happen, many people I know in your life where you've been doing this, you talk to somebody about something, they're like, no, that's dumb. <laughs> then a month later, they call, come back and they go, hey, Tom, remember that thing you were talking about? Yeah, I'm gonna talk to you about that again. Right, he's nodding, because he knows it happens all the time. Right, I didn't convert them. You gave them the epiphany moment, when they went, maybe I'm not perfect, huh. Something else pops up and they talk to you again. And now we're rocking and rolling. So your point's a valid one. How do I convert them? I don't. I just get them to go, huh, now I win. I'm not concerned about winning an argument. I don't want to win their minds. I want to win their hearts. If I win their hearts, I'll get their minds. All I want is their hearts. I'll get their minds later. No worries. Always happens that way. Win the hearts first. If I can get them to just doubt that what they think is perfect, that maybe I'm right or I have a point, I can win. So the disruption piece says, I feel you. It's what we don't do well, right? We say, can't you see the logic in my argument? Can't you see how smart I am? What's wrong with you? That's how many of us talk. It is who we are. I got it. Here's the problem. We are right. It's true. We're right. And because we're right, we want to show you how right I am. I'm asking you instead to just have the conversation. Be right later, right? We'll be right later. We don't be right right now. We'll be right later. Does that make sense? It does, thank you. Good. Any other question or comment? Go ahead, please. Do you have a real life example where this strategy worked? Yeah, me. <laughs> yeah, me. In, uh, in, 20, in 2011, if I had heard uh, the now famous Daryl Perry speak, I would have thought Daryl Perry was simply insane. That's what I would have thought. I would have believed that. I was not prepared to hear any message close to being a libertarian. I was not prepared mentally to hear it, so I didn't. I was totally turned off from politics. I thought they were all crooks, they were all bad, which is true, but they were all crooks, they were all bad, and I was thinking that Nader was probably the guy, just because he wasn't them. Not that I knew any policies, I just thought he wasn't them, so he's probably the right guy, I had no idea. I heard Gary Johnson speak, and that made me think, huh, that was my epiphany moment. 2012, I heard him speak at an epiphany moment. I thought, maybe these liber what? Liber what? Liberals? Liberal what? I didn't even know the party. I didn't even know. I didn't even know. Say again? Librarians. Librarians. Maybe these librarians are smart. <laughs> should, go, should go to the library and figure out what's going on. And from that point myself, that was my epiphany moment. I wasn't won over when I first heard Gary Johnson. I didn't go, oh my God, liberty, yes. Not what I did. I was, huh. Then I went to a local meeting. And I met people, I thought, oh, you're like regular people. 
<laughs> oh, you're just regular people. And before you know it, then I was moved. So my own self, I'm, I'm telling you what I do for myself. Does that make sense? Excellent. So I'm going to go up, please. Uh, yes, uh, you're talking, as I interpret it, about speaking to individuals, basically. And I think you're right on target. How then, especially for our candidates, can they apply that to media interviews? Media interviews, meaning they're being interviewed and this interview will go out to many people. Why is it di what's the difference? Why would that change? Well, do they have to address the doubt to the interviewer or to the audience? Yeah, that's a good point. Well, give me an example of who you'd be interviewed by for, the, for this case. Who was the interview? Who, what's his, is it local radio? Is it national TV? Well, Just give me an example. Let's say I was <laughs> running for U.S. Senator and Katie Couric was going to interview you. Love that. Address the doubts to making her doubt or to making the audience that we're getting to doubt. I love that. Now, when a case of an interview, you're always actually talking to the audience. You're actually talking to the audience. It looks like I'm talking to you, I'm really talking to them. That's the key. They have to see it and understand whatever you're saying. Does that make sense? So, I'm, oh, I'm talking to my audience, who I think my audience is. So I'm gonna think to myself, if I'm the campaign manager, right, if I'm managing the campaign, who is watching Katie Kirk? Who's watching her? That's who I'm talking to. Does that make sense? And I want to act as if that person is, is Katie Couric. Couric. That's who I'm going to pretend that person is. So you're, you're saying then the candidate has to learn how to talk to the ditzes too? Yes. Don't they vote? <laughs> Don't they vote? Yes, of course. This is the number one thing that maybe I wasn't clear on. I've talked about this before. We have to remember something. We have a mindset of us versus them. That is a bad mindset. That mindset works very well when you're Democrat, Republican, works very well because you're just trying to get the middle people, you're fighting. The other guy's worse than me, I still win. We can't be that way. We are one big family. Except a lot of our brothers and sisters have walked away from home. I want them back home. Bring them back. And some of them have done things I don't want them, you know, I wish they hadn't done. Some of them think ways I wish they don't think. But they're still my family, they're still my brother and sister, and I want them back home. That must be our mindset. These people out there who think we're crazy, they are not our enemies. They are the people we need to turn to vote for us, to join our party. So even the ditzes, okay, enemies have a ditzy brother, ditzy sister. Okay, I still love them. I still want them back in my household. I still want them back into fold. So yeah, even them, absolutely. Any other question? Please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> another fear that you didn't mention is I can be free, I can handle that, but if all these other people were free, then that would be a problem. Absolutely. It's a great question. This happens to all, all the time, right? What about people who make errors? Or what about people who can't be free? Or what about people who insert thing here? Well, realize something. Right now we use government, right? So we do. What is government's answer to almost every bad problem? Prison. That's the answer. Fine and imprisonment. That is the answer that government always uses. And I would ask you, is that the right answer to the problem? Not just that. Most people who need help, what they need more than anything else in almost any situation is someone who cares. Isn't that true? That's what most people need in any form of help that you need. You need someone who cares, right? Whatever that might, in any case, someone who cares. Can government care? Ask that question. Can government care? Can government love? All government can do, and what it does very well, is create a system, make you a number, and force you into that system. It does that very well. Forces you into a system. Right? It's what it does well. Well, if I want to help people, I want to care or love, about, love people. And in every situation you've seen this happen, when you really help people, it's almost always private or nonprofit. Almost always. Somehow St. Jude's Hospital in New York does an amazing job with kids for free. Somehow it does it. Better than any, thing, any other you could think of. I'm a vet. The VA? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you kidding me? We need to take care of vets. So government organization? Boy, that works out well. About 100 Americans kill themselves every day, give or take. Right? 22 of those are vets. About 10% of the population is veteran population. Twice as many vets commit suicide every day in the United States. How good is the VA doing? That's what I'm saying. Government is not the answer to take care of people. 
Now, why doesn't someone take care? Why doesn't someone take care of the people? And it's going to sound crazy because they believe government is. They have no need to. They see no hole to fill. And those who try to fill the hole are often stifled by government because you must now fit this issue or that issue. On a personal note, I don't work with the VA. They've asked me many times. I do training for veterans for transition. I will not work with them because what they make me fall into does not work. But it checks their box as being done. Government wants to make sure the box is checked. They don't care if people are helped. The box is checked. So when I go work with them, I have to fall within their realm, which does not work, so I'm ineffective, but I check the box and they get a thumbs up. So I've decided I will not work with you. I work on my own instead, and now I get success. Does that answer, does that answer your question? If you want things to work well, pull government out. An example in New York City, there was, a, a, there was actually in New York City a group of people who were nonprofit bringing showers to homeless. Mobile showers, so that the homeless people could shower, get washed without having to go to a Starbucks and ruin Starbucks, right? Which is what was happening. Shower, peep, shower, and leave. Give them free clothes, change of clothes, whatever. Doing it for free. The government shut it down. The government shut it down. Oh, you know, you can't be on the side of the road, side of the street, whatever. Shut it down completely because of regulations. Now, guess what the homeless have? Nothing. Nothing. I'm sure somehow the government will come up with some way to spend 80,000 bazillion dollars to build some shower that won't work. <laughs> They'll do that instead and check a box. See, we built showers. See how awesome we are? We built showers. Or they can simply say, there was a need there. Private sector, find an answer. As long as we have a transition period, and I have to focus on that piece. If I tell the world today, we're going to get rid of X, and there are three years we're going to get rid of it, here's how it's going to work. Are you telling me Americans aren't going to go, I see a profit center? Of course they are. <laughs> I see a way of making money. Or the reverse, I see a way of using, turning my passion into nonprofit work. I see a way of actually helping people I've wanted to help for years. Of course they will. They always do. That happens every single time. But we stop it because then so, who's responsible? Who can I sue? Who can I point to? Who can I blame? Mm, not so easy. Go ahead in the back. Uh, so I think we have a lot of agreement on what the government should do, but uh, do we have a consensus on what the government should do? Or what's, the, what's the government's responsibility? It's a great point. I think the answer actually is no. I think the answer is no to that. I don't think most people are, have, particularly libertarians, I don't think anybody really says that that's the answer. I think every libertarian would say less is better. I think that would be universal. We would all say less is better. We would all say the more that the individual can be responsible would be better. And I think we would all say as a general rule, look, if there's no victim, why is the government getting involved? I think that's some things that most people would agree. If there's no victim, why is the government getting involved, right? Is, is sin a crime? And I think most people would say, the libertarians would say, no, sin is not a crime, right? A crime is a crime. If that crime happens to be a sin, fine. But a crime is a crime, a sin is a sin. Does that make sense or no? So I think that's probably where I think most libertarians would have common ground on that side. But otherwise, I think it's, it's you have some who still think that, you know, government should be bigger, some anarchists. But I think we all agree. This, when people were talking to me when I was running before, but Larry, you have a difference between this person and that person and this person and that person who was running for VP. And I said, look, when we're at a point to where I can call one of my VP people an anarchist or I can call them a status, someone can claim that I'm a statist, life is good. Let's get there. Let's get to a point where I'm a statist. <laughs> Let's get there. I want to be there, right? So if, if, you're, if you're making government smaller, we're in the same team. If we get to a point where I'm a statist, we're winning. <laughs> Life is good. So I'm not really that concerned about that. Go ahead, please. Uh, with the VP primary in the past, what's next for you? Uh, good question. I can't announce anything officially, but I am looking at considering uh, Governor of New York 2018. But I don't know. I'm looking at. Yes. No, I don't know. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking at. That's all. Yes. Good. Any other questions or comments? Great. Thank you. Thank you.